Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Very glad you're with us for the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Happy to report that Jim made it back safe and sound from the field trip to the Gettysburg National Battlefield. And we've got good, bad, and crazy martinis in store for you today. Uh, Jim, I know it was not the coolest day to be out there, but uh, I hope it went well. Greg, by at least one measure, it was the best field trip ever. And you know what that measure is? What? Not a single kid barfed. Oh, excellent. You know, usually we get at least one, gets car sick. The, uh, the local school district's very nice, particularly when it's the end of the year, sixth grade uh, trip to Gettysburg. You know, it's about two and a quarter, two and a half hours. So they rent the really nice buses, not your usual school buses. And so um, the only other complaint is that the air conditioning really didn't work well on the ride home. And we had a little bit of traffic and all that stuff. But by and large, kids learned a lot, of, had a good time. They learned several valuable lessons. High ground is good. Low ground is bad. <laughs> yes. Um, if you can't see it, you can't shoot it, which is just kind of a good, useful lesson for everybody in life. And then finally, hungry soldiers will eat anything, including skunk. Wow. That's what they're going to yeah. take. That's what they're going to take away. 20 years from now, that's what they're going to Absolutely. <laughs> right there. <laughs> The field trip was totally worth it. Well, glad. Good. Glad you're done. Glad you hit that milestone. Um, I don't know if you're going to retire after that. I mean, it's hard to, to, to end on a higher note than that. But uh, uh, congr- it, it congratulations. Doesn't get it. it really, it doesn't. And <laughs> thankfully, as my kids are getting older, they don't really need as many parental chaperones and stuff like that. Also, didn't lose a single kid, and I had more than usual. So Wow. Well, plenty of uh, important stuff to talk about today, Jim. We should also mention that today we're brought to you by X Chair. Many of us spend more time every day in our office chair than in our cars or beds. And that's why it's so important to invest in the right chair to spend those hours with the right level of support and comfort to get the most productivity out of your day. X Chair has made my time at my desk not only more productive, but it's honestly my favorite place to sit for any reason. Not only does X Chair's patented Dynamic Variable Lumbar, or DVL, offer the ultimate customized support, but my X-Chair can even give me a massage or heat up or cool down. And now, thanks to X-Chair's new FS360 armrests, I can even adjust my armrests to the perfect position. All of these unique X-Chair features help the hours at my desk fly by in complete comfort, and that is why I love my X-Chair. Go to xchairmartini.com now. That's the letter X, chair, M-A-R-T-I-N-I.com, or call 1-844-4X-CHAIR for $100 off your order. X-Chair has a 30-day guarantee of complete comfort, and you can finance your purchase for as little as $30 per month. One more time, xchairmartini.com. All right, Jim, on to our content for the day on all of that. All right, let's get into our... Um, Good, bad, and crazy martinis here. Joe Biden features prominently in all of them. Uh, The good martini is that even the Washington Post is calling out Biden for just a blatant lie uh, as he's beginning this op-ed offensive because no one's ever turned around their uh, dismal approval numbers more effectively than by going with a series of op-eds. And that's that's how the Biden administration is going after this uh, poor economy right now. Uh, This is what Biden said, or at least whoever wrote this, in the Wall Street Journal. A dozen CEOs of America's largest utility companies told me earlier this year that my plan would reduce the average family's annual utility bills by $500 and accelerate our transition from energy produced by autocrats. There's so many things to sigh about and groan about there, but let's just look at the fact of the $500 projection in savings. Not true. Glenn Kessler over at the Washington Post When we located the transcript of Biden's conversation with utility executives on February 9th, we found no reference to $500 in utility savings. The figure was also not mentioned in the White House readout of the meeting. Biden's also lying about the numbers. uh, This is uh, from Ed Morrissey at Hot Air. He pulled the $500 figure from a friendly analysis by the Rhodium Group that was prepared in October. That report predicted $500 annual savings in overall energy costs, not just utilities, and not until 2030. Most of that savings came from eliminating gasoline from family budgets as cars would go completely onto the grid. The actual projected utility savings would be 
Now quoting the report, indeed the report notes that if the Biden climate plan were adopted, home electricity bills by 2030 would be between $1 more and $5 less than under current policy, which might pay for an extra ice cream cone over the summer. So after that bit of analysis, uh, Glenn Kessler says, Biden didn't hear that from utility executives, and the report he's citing is not about household utility bill savings. Most of the claimed savings come from the reduced cost of driving, and the estimate is for 2030 when he would no longer be president, even if he served a second term. Is there any doubt the president earns for Pinocchios? And so, Jim, so many other problems that we'd probably like to bring up, uh, even with his shift away from fossil fuels. But uh, what, do you, what do you make of the fact that even the Washington Post at this point is derailing the president's uh, pretty weak uh, PR attempt to improve uh, perceptions of the economy here? Yeah, Greg, I think one of the first things that jumped out is that Glenn Kessler, if you uh, ask a lot of conservatives, if you just mention his name in front of conservatives, you're probably going to get some sighing, eye rolling, scoffing or other, you know, just reflexive sense. And the idea, the perception that he you know, comes down like a ton of bricks on Republicans, but either never sees it or never bothers to look at Democrats, or if he does, he turns himself into a pretzel. Well, in this case, he does, you know, Glenn Kessler called this one exactly as we would want him to, he calls it as he saw it, exactly the way we would want it to be done, and gives him the full four Pinocchios and says, no, there's no way to remotely justify this. I think what's intriguing, you said, you know, what president has ever gotten themselves out of trouble by writing an op-ed in the, you know, in a paper like the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal? Uh, you know, I, I think it's kind of intriguing that president this, this president in particular doesn't do sit down interviews. This president takes a few questions at the end of press conferences here and there um, or walking to the helicopter or something like that. So when you're writing an op ed, generally you have a certain space limitation and you have to make your argument within that. And you have to, you know, shape out and ideally cite a little bit of supporting evidence and stuff like that. So I think there could be some usefulness. It kind of forces a perhaps rambling president to kind of focus and try to make their arguments succinctly, directly, and persuasively. And I think this was a terrible failure on the part of the president doing this, but I'm glad when the president does this uh, because it kind of gives us something to get into their mindset. Now, here's the thing. I don't know how much time President Biden actually spent reviewing this op-ed. I don't, I don't envision Biden sitting down at a laptop and, you know, hamming it out and stuff like that. Clearly, this was ghostwritten. Now, maybe this was ghostwritten after a conversation with the president, or maybe this ghost, you know, the president looked back, gave some feedback. What I thought was really interesting about this, Greg, and I, I, I kind of noted this in today's Morning Jolt. So this is a written op-ed. Presumably, it goes through several layers of people looking at it. I mean, they had several opportunities to pick this out and say, no, no, no that, that didn't happen in that conversation. But no one did, right? So assuming that this was ghostwritten, the ghostwriter, Greg, managed to really capture Biden's voice <laughs> by writing something that's an inaccurate, half-remembered anecdote in which someone tells Biden how great his idea is. Remember, it's not Biden saying it's going to save you $500. It's the utility company executives who are saying, wow, Mr. President, this is such a swell idea. This is going to save everybody $500 because if there's anything utility company CEOs want, it's want they want people paying less for, for electricity and other utilities. Um, but he, he just gushes about it. And so this is, you know, um, uh, you know, very typical for Biden. You know, like it, it would be very easy. I wouldn't be surprised if Biden had told his speechwriter or whoever was writing this, this sort of anecdote. And I don't know whether the person never went back and checked or whether they thought it was close enough or, or what it was. Um, so in a very we were used to Biden speaking off the cuff and remembering conversations that never happened or remembering people saying things that they never said. It's very interesting to see this happen in written form that Biden remembers or, or someone probably writing on Biden's behalf remembering a conversation that did not happen. Um, I think this is uh, another sign of kind of a flailing White House. I think it's not uh, that. And I think it's also a good sign for, for you know folks on the right or just people who are very frustrated with this administration that folks like Glenn Kessler aren't giving him a free ride anymore and kind of saying, nope, nope, sorry, Mr. President. That's not what was said. That's not what happened. That's not what the report says. And you're just pulling numbers out of your butt right now. All right, Jim. Well, calling out uh, the president's lies is, it could be a full-time uh, job. It's also important to call out bad legislation. The Three Martini Lunch is brought to us today by NetChoice. As Americans, innovation has always been what makes us different. America's tech industry outpaces the world. We have the most innovative companies that power our economy and our way of life. And the reason? Free market innovation. It's what makes us number one. 
But some in Washington want to put big government in charge of America's top innovators. And they're attacking our own in the name of competition, while our true competitors, like Europe and China, close the gap. NetChoice believes congressional conservatives must stand up for American innovation, not big government, by rejecting progressive antitrust proposals. They encourage you to tell your senator to oppose Senator Amy Klobuchar's Senate Resolution 2992. Learn more about this fight and send a letter to your representatives at netchoice.org 2992. This message brought to you by NetChoice. All right, Jim, on to our bad martini now. And we talked about uh, Biden's lame offensive when it comes to PR for his uh, economic record. And that's probably the main reason why his approval numbers are still either in the 30s or the very low 40s, depending on the poll. Uh, So in addition uh, to this PR offensive, uh, here's what we are learning from this administration. We've got a three-pronged attack here. Uh, First of all, they're going to try to convince skeptical voters, and this is from Politico, convince skeptical voters that despite their current misgivings, the economy is actually doing quite well. In more common terms, don't believe your lying eyes. We're doing great. You're just not smart enough to appreciate it. Number two, calm fears about inflation and reassure both everyday Americans and major economic players that Biden has a plan to address it. And three, to thwart GOP efforts to try to hang inflation like an albatross around Democrats ahead of the midterms and maybe even going on offense by accusing the GOP of pushing policies that will make the economy worse. And Jim, it's interesting that this comes at the exact same time that Biden is admitting he has no plan no idea how to bring gas prices down anytime in the near future. So uh, must be a really great secret uh, plan to battle inflation there. So what do you make of this three-pronged attack? Greg, when I saw these stories, uh, these seemingly contradictory statements from Biden, one minute, look, there's only that's not much I can do, coupled with, trust me, I've got a plan for this. <laughs> and, and the other previously mentioned comments about how, oh, and if you enact my agenda, it's going to save $500 in your utility bills, things like that. Um, I was thought of that NBC story that pointed to a White House really in disarray, uh, pointed a very, I think, a very ugly portrait of the president, whining that things have gone so badly for him, uh, fuming that not enough Democrats are going on to television and uh, defending him. By the way, who does that sound like? Um, and just other comments that I, you know prompted me to write yesterday's morning jolt. Uh, basically contending the president is too old for it. The the job is too hard for him. I don't know if this is a physical issue. I don't know if this is a mental energy issue. But on half of his appearances, he comes out and and not only does he uh, often ramble and and kind of, you know, often offer some kind of comment that undermines the case he was trying to make. uh, Not only does he just blurt out the first thought that pops into his head in a way that usually, you know, uh, damages his interests, you know, for God's sake, this man cannot remain in power or, you know, well, if it's a limited incursion and stuff like that. Um, he's, he's just not up to the job. And he's got, you know, yes, a very full plate of problems. Every president gets a full plate of problems. I, I'm trying to, you know, maybe Clinton in the mid 90s had a nice stretch of the economy booming, relative peace and prosperity, uh, things like that. But even he had things like the Oklahoma City bombing. Even he had problems that were, were coming, you know, uh, Elian Gonzalez, right? You know, if you're president, problems are going to pile up on you. That's just part of the job. So this idea that, oh, oh, poor Biden, no one could have foreseen all this stuff. Look, he went around the country telling us he was the guy who was ready for this. Remember, I'm not going to shut down the co- economy. I'm not going to shut down the country. I'm going to shut down the virus. And of course, it took us a year and a half in the Omicron wave for most Americans to build up some immunity towards uh, the, the COVID-19 virus. He's in over his head. And I think the fact that you see these two contradictory impulses of, look, what do you want me to do? There's not much I can do. Yeah, is there there a lot the president can do regarding inflation? You know, the Fed has a big say in this. Yes, the international economic environment has a big say in this. But the U.S. has higher rates of inflation than a lot of our uh, comparable Western economies. And a big chunk of that is because during the pandemic and the the aftermath of the pandemic, particularly that... uh, uh, the Relief Act that was passed in March 2021, we dumped a lot of money, nearly $6 trillion into the economy. And it was basically the Fed just effectively running the printing presses. So you throw all that, you know, what is inflation? Well, it's a lot more money chasing not enough goods. You know, ideally, your amount of money and your amount of goods go into the economy at the same amount and the, the uh, value of the currency remains stable. If you keep the printing presses going all the time, and by the way, it's not printing presses anymore, it's just like the Fed presses a button and transfers the money to the banks. Uh, but when the, when the federal government does that, you effectively create, make lower the value of the currency. Now, some of this is 
uh, a bad sign. You know, some of this is a reflection of you know lingering supply chain issues and things like that. But as we see, you know, various other issues like the uh, the, the infant formula shortage. At one point, Biden thought, oh, we're going to take care of this in, a, in about a week or two. There was all kinds of contradictions yesterday about when he was briefed, what he knew. He said that he didn't hear about it until May. You know, you're wondering, you know, this is a front page story in the Wall Street Journal in January. What does it take to get something in front of the president? I don't know about you, Greg. I can't help but wonder, how many hours a day is the president at his desk or getting briefings? Or what, what's his workload like? We don't, we don't, we only see him in about one public event a day. You know, the man is 79 years old. We can see that he's not the guy he used to be. And I kind of wonder whether he only has a couple of good hours a day in it. And I don't think you can be a good president when you're only um, lucent or lucid and uh, aware and cognizant and, and mentally sharp for a few hours a day. And oh, by the way, we notice he goes to Delaware every weekend. Apparently, I think the Washington Examiner has a study that says more than a quarter of his presidency has been spent has, at his beach house in Delaware. This does not seem like a man who's ready, who can handle these problems, you know, these challenges. Yeah, Russia invading Ukraine is a big curveball. But, you know, welcome to the presidency. The buck stops here. You asked for this job. Stop complaining about how hard it is and start solving problems or move aside for someone else. Uh, although I recognize the vice president really would, you know, most of us would not be overwhelmed with confidence with the prospect of President Kamala Harris. No, no, not in the least. And since I assume they're not going to make the sensible policy changes like expanding American energy production and that sort of thing, which would bring prices down and bring the price of everything else down. I, for one, welcome this as their backup strategy because nothing works better than telling the American people, no, 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 no. Your life's great. You think it's bad, but actually it's really, really good. And you just aren't smart enough to understand that. I am doing a fantastic job. That's what the American people love to be told, is that they're wrong and they don't understand how good their life is. <laughs> because Yeah, I'm trying to think of anything more likely to... Uh... Uh, to a aggravate voters, I, I suppose if you just went around calling them stupid, which, by the way, considering Biden's mouth is not, you know, not not unthinkable as well. Yeah, this uh, is but, like, a... uh, yeah, not going to work. You know, the idea of nothing, nothing, nothing matters. So, this, you know, that's, that's not going to be great to motivate Democrats to get out. And the there's nothing I can do uh, or, or, you know, hey, it's not as bad. And you're just a whiner. That's not going to do very well with voters either. <laughs> yeah, it's like a national look fat. Like you did to that one guy in the presidential campaign. or Dog-faced pony soldier. Whatever, you know. <laughs> Varmint. Get your facts straight, Jack, even though mine are. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a great strategy. Can't, can't imagine why Republicans are favored uh, to win this year. All right. In the meantime, uh, Father's Day is coming up long before Election Day. So let's make sure you're all set for that. So kids, wives, moms. Take a look at this fantastic deal. Here's a little wisdom from Omaha Steaks. Dads want steak. Yes, the crafts are great. Even the ties are very nice. We love those things, love the cards. But we also want steak. So when you give dad perfectly aged and oh-so-tender steaks, you're not just giving him the best meal of his life, but the chance to grill them up and make a memory with you. And right now, uh, Omaha Steaks is offering the Dad's Want Steaks package for just $99. This limited-time package includes 16 mouth-watering entrees dad is guaranteed to love, like smoky, tender, bacon-wrapped filet mignons, gourmet jumbo franks, and the air-chilled boneless chicken breasts, and for a sweet finish, delicious caramel apple tartlets. Absolutely love the steaks. Absolutely love the burgers. Oh, and you get eight free Omaha Steaks burgers while we're talking about that. So you really can't beat this deal. Visit omahasteaks.com and type martini into the search bar and order the Dad's Want Steaks package today. You'll get eight of their new, bigger Omaha Steaks burgers absolutely free. And because it's Omaha Steaks, everything is backed by their 100% money-back guarantee. That's omahasteaks.com. And then type martini in the search bar and order the Dad's Want Steaks package today. Cancel culture is coming to your bank and holding the wrong political views might soon leave you out in the cold. I'm Bill Walton. On the latest episode of The Bill Walton Show, Todd Zwicky, Paul Watkins, and I discuss what is already happening, how the Biden administration is already pursuing this agenda, and what we can do about it. This progressive culture offensive is relentless. It's coming for you, and you won't hear about this anywhere else. Follow The Bill Walton Show at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, Jim, let's move on to our crazy martini now. Time for uh, a little bit of insanity up in Boston. 
basically in the very same day. Uh, first of all, yesterday, Christopher Ray, the FBI director, speaking at the Boston Conference on Cybersecurity, reporting, and you chronicle this uh, over in the corner today, in the summer of 2021, hackers sponsored by the Iranian government tried to conduct one of the most despicable cyber attacks I've seen. This is Ray talking. Right here in Boston, when they decided to go after Boston Children's Hospital. Let me repeat that. Boston Children's Hospital. We got a report from one of our intelligence partners indicating Boston Children's was about to be targeted and understanding the urgency of the situation. The cyber squad in our Boston field office raced to notify the hospital. Our folks got the hospital's team the information they needed to stop the danger right away. We were able to help them ID and then mitigate the threat. So a huge exhale there. The editorial board of the Boston Globe also on Wednesday reporting, quote, Biden shouldn't let bad optics sink a restored nuclear deal with Iran. Negotiators have arrived at a point where restoring the Iran nuclear deal is possible, but one significant political obstacle remains. Iran is insisting that the United States take its Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps off this country's terrorist list. Reportedly, President Biden has rejected that demand, absent some kind of significant concession from Iran. The White House isn't commenting, but if that becomes a sticking point, that keeps the deal from being resurrected. It will be a foreign policy blunder. So, cyber terrorism, bad. Keeping Iran on the terrorism list, also bad. Jim, what are we doing here? Well, I, I, I was going to say, you and I are on record of being, at minimum, extraordinarily skeptical of restoring the Iran deal, if not full-throated, frothing at the mouth, red-faced, veins-bulging opponents of it. And the I don't think there's any good day. I, I think one of the challenges Iran deal restoration proponents have is that there's really no sign that the Iranians have any good faith at this. There's no sign that this is really much of a priority for them. They're kind of like, well, we'll take the concessions if you want to make them, but we're not going to change any of our behavior. And the fact that they came up with this new, oh, by the way, you can't call the Revolutionary Guard Corps a terrorist anymore. Uh, to me indicates that, you know, what, whatever you concessions we make, they'll always come up with another one. But, you know, so there's never a good day to make the argument, hey, we should make these concessions because getting a deal with Iran is worth it. And admittedly, the Boston Globe editorial board did not know that Ray was going to come out and reveal this information today. But I think it made a particularly bad day to say, look, we've got to make more concessions to Iran. D don't worry about them trying to hack the local children's hospital. <laughs> like, you know, like it's, it's the irony is like, oh, you know, if they remember the hacking the oil, the Russian uh, affiliated or Russian based hackers who were uh, hacking the oil pipeline. That was really bad and annoying. Right. There are lots of, you know, uh, hacking a bank, local state governments, all kinds of ways. And you know, that, that's all bad. But a children's hospital. That's what you know, you could hear it in Ray's voice. And when you emphasize, he stops and underlines it in red. Like to him, he, he is not morally offended, doesn't really, he's just outraged by this, right? He really, you can't, you know, he can't even believe, even, the, even by the standards of the Iranian mullahs, this is low, right? And this demonstrates that they can't be trusted. And this demonstrates that they're not misunderstood or there's some sort of, you know, they're uh, opposed to us, but there's some rationality there. No, no, they're just, look, we just can't trust them. They're too malevolent, too despicable, too cruel, too barbaric, and just too implacably hostile to who we are and what we stand for, for us to ever say, okay, we're going to trust you on this. Here's what we're going to let you do. Here's what we're not going to let you do. It's just not workable. And so I'll give Biden, when it becomes official, I'll give Biden credit. It's a good sign that we're hearing that he will not take the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps off the terrorist list. That presumably that would seem to sink the possibility of restoring the Iran deal. It has only taken until June of his second year in office for him to reach that point. Um, and, but it's not official yet, and there's always a chance that he changes his mind or something like that. So I, I'm not going to give him full credit for this yet. But I think it's just for the Boston Globe editorial board. There's a lot of egg on their faces today. They didn't know Ray was going to come out with this, but it, they look naive and silly for insisting, well, they're not great, but we should reach a deal on a day when it wasn't just any old children's hospital, it was a children's hospital in their own backyard. Wake up, Boston Globe editorial board. Yeah, that's about as that's about as uh, incongruous as you can possibly get. I mean, on one hand, I think the Iranians would love to see the United States groveling to whatever conditions they throw out there to restore the deal. On the other hand, I think they might just be having fun trying to see how much they can get out of this, even if they don't want the deal. It almost reminds me 
of uh, George Costanza trying to uh, get out of his engagement with Susan on Seinfeld. And so he tried to tell her he wanted a prenup, and then he pretended he was a smoker. And so just to see how far she'd go to actually make the marriage happen. And uh, ultimately, of course, she died uh, licking toxic glue on cheap wedding invitation envelopes. So, uh, (laughs) Jim, I don't know what the Iranian goal is here, but I'm sure it's to humiliate us in one way or another. I was going to say, you could almost see them saying, uh, now you must sign the deal by hopping on one foot. You know? <laughs> yes, exactly. And you must write it backwards. And you have to wear a pink tutu. And, you know, just coming up with one, you know, one example after another uh, of how, you know, of just what, what, what can we put in there that, make the, that will make them say no? And my speaking suspicion is that um, certainly with some negotiators in the past, it seemed like the U.S. was desperate uh, to reach a deal. And I, I think, you know, everybody's kind of been in denial of this idea that look in the end the iranians don't want to do what we want them to do they're just not going to be trustworthy and we need to find an alternative solution ideally you know not not itching you know this doesn't mean we start bombing tehran tomorrow but ideally we maximize the economic pressure on them and we end up uh caught you know putting a point where they realize okay we cannot economically thrive without this we have to give up our ambitions for a nuclear bomb Hopping on one foot in a pink tutu is reasonable. It's the way we... I do that on Sundays anyway. Conduct diplomacy. <laughs> I was going to do that anyway. <laughs> Jim, good to have you back. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, do subscribe to the podcast if you don't already. Tell a good friend about us as well. Uh, thanks so much for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Please keep those coming. Get us on your home devices. All you have to say is play 3 Martini Lunch podcast. Follow us on Twitter. He is at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great Thursday, and please join us on Friday for the next 3 Martini Lunch. Former Russiagate investigator Cash Patel takes us deep into what we know about the Russia hoax and talks about his new children's book on the subject. I'm Sarah Carter. On the latest Sarah Carter Show, I'll also explain how the powerful are openly telling you how they plan to restrict your freedom of speech and keep track of your every move. But of course, they say it's all for your own good. Join me. Follow the Sarah Carter Show at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.